So on behalf of the National Centre for Creative Health and the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being, I'd like to welcome everyone to the launch of the Creative Health Review Report. I'm Alex Coulter, Director of the National Centre for Creative Health, and it's lovely to see everyone here, despite train strikes, winter weather, etc. A warm welcome also to our online audience, and I hope that's all functioning, can't tell. Um, and please do say who you are in the chat and chat to each other during the event. If you'd like to tweet, please use the hashtag Creative Health Review, which is on the screen. And um, we do have live captions, which should be visible to both our online and our live audiences. Everyone here has a copy of the report and online, uh, you should have a link in the chat, which takes you to the online version. A couple of housekeeping announcements first. There's no planned fire alarm. So if we do, do hear an alarm, we should all exit through the door at the back and towards the workshop, which is more or less opposite. And in there, there is a fire escape which takes us out to the muster point and people, staff from the science gallery will be here to help us. If you need the toilets, there are toilets just here in this room at the back in the right hand corner there. We're extremely grateful to King's College London and the science gallery for hosting this event this evening. We have a packed agenda, but we'll attempt to keep to time. Lord Howarth of Newport will now welcome you and speak about the Creative Health Review. Lord Howth is Chair of the Commissioners for the Creative Health Review, Chair of the National Centre for Creative Health and Co-Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing. As many of you know, he has been a great inspiration and the best of allies on this creative health journey over many years, and I'm delighted to introduce him. Thank you, Alex, for those very kind words. First of all, I want to say how very sorry I am that I can't be with you physically this afternoon. I have a condition of my immune system, which makes it unsafe for me to take part in indoor gatherings at which many people are present. But thank goodness for Zoom, and it enables not only me, but some 450 other people to uh, attend this event online. I thank everyone for their attendance, whether physical or virtual. King's College London have been our friends and allies since the beginning of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing's inquiry in 2015. That inquiry and the Creative Health Report published in 2017 laid the foundations for this Creative Health Review, which we launched, which we launched in October last year. People do ask, what is creative health? And it's a term that uh, hasn't yet taken the place that it needs to do in the language of the nation. It hasn't quite reached the status of RIS, though I'm very confident that when the Oxford English Dictionary decides on the word of 2024, it will be creative health. In a nutshell, the creative health proposition is a rediscovery of the ancient wisdom that the exercise of the creative imagination is beneficial to our health and well being. The purpose of the Creative Health Review has been to make recommendations to government and to metropolitan mayors for a cross governmental integrated strategy to enable the full potential of creative health to help meet myriad challenges facing our communities. These challenges demand a new approach, one that is forward thinking preventative and person-centered. Our key messages are, first, creative health is fundamental to a healthy and prosperous society, and its benefits should be available and accessible to all. Second, creative health should form an integral part of a 21st century health and social care system, one that is holistic, person-centered, and which focuses on reducing inequalities and supporting people to live well for longer. Third, creating the conditions for creative health to flourish requires a joined up whole system approach, incorporating health systems, local authorities, schools, and the cultural and voluntary community social enterprise sectors. 
The themes we chose for the Creative Health Review are health inequalities, mental health, education, social care, end of life care and bereavement, and then cost and value and leadership and strategy. You will find a wide range of evidence and practice examples related to each of these themes in the report. Each theme was informed by a public online round table where we heard compelling evidence and powerful stories which collectively make a very strong case for the wide uptake and spread of this work at all levels of policy and delivery. The challenges and opportunities highlighted in, in our round tables require commitment from many government departments, not just the Department for Health and Social Care and the Department for Culture, but also the Departments for Leveling Up, Education and Justice. We need a strategic approach driven by Number 10 and the Cabinet Office and supported by the Treasury that integrates creative health into a wider range of policies, thereby enabling pressing policy issues, especially health inequalities, to be addressed more effectively and some pressure removed from struggling health and care services. I'm very grateful to my fellow officers of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing. The National Centre for Creative Health and the All Party Group have worked together on this Creative Health Review. My co-chair of the group, Tracy Crouch, is also a commissioner for the review. We've received expert guidance from our distinguished group of commissioners, several of whom are with us this afternoon, and you'll be hearing from them in due course. And I thank them because they are very busy people and they've done a fantastic job with us. I also, of course, want to thank our funders, the Baring Foundation, the Oak Foundation, Paul Hamlin Foundation, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and UK Research and Innovation. I want to express my thanks and admiration for the team at the National Centre for Creative Health, Alex Coulter, Alexis Bart, and Dr. Hannah Waterson. Hannah, I give my very, very warm thanks to. She has achieved an extraordinary feat in drafting this report. We've also benefited benefited absolutely indispensably from a group of from the involvement of a group of people with lived experience their powerful testimonies speak truth to power and bring into sharp focus the reasons why we do this work i'm absolutely delighted that we have two speakers to start us off who represent their voices josie moon and kelly mclaughlin from east marsh united in grimsby in Northeast Lincolnshire. Welcome to you, and please will you step up to the platform. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm originally from Scunthorpe, but living and working in Grinsby now. I'm a proud owner of my Through My, Through my Eyes photography. And I'm also recently a director for East Marsh United for the creative panel. I am also a community organiser for Common Good Foundation funded by Lord Morris Glasman, where, where we're developing a new civic organisation to empower citizens across Grinsby, Cleethorpes and Immigham, which is the North East Lincolnshire area. I met Josie at East Marsh United during the pan pandemic from joining the writing group which is my creative health community. I'd like to share these words with you, with you, a poem I wrote to express how I feel about my work on myself and my community. <clears throat> I'm a victim of the system, born a mother, another victim. Fact, my mum and me, both victims of the system. Mother's bite, vicious life, me signposted in the wrong direction, paths collapse, Chaotic spiraled, my risky behavior. Me, bright, opinionated, frustrated. They passed me from pillar to post. I destroyed. 
Grinsby found me again. Genuine care, family, therapy, safety. Taught me the visual tools to map myself, to map my life. My community showed me the right direction. Gave me back my voice. Listened to me, gave me back my life. I am delighted to be here tonight to share my lived experience to say how important creativity is, has been for me in my journey back to a better mental health and well-being. I am now also a part of our community choir and our pantomime team. <laughs> oh no, I'm not. <laughs> so my I couldn't help that. So my creativity is growing in new directions. Creativity has been my medicine, my safety, my recovery, more powerful than any drug, any, any drug or any interventions ever been. Before I introduce you to Josie, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank East Marsh United, especially Josie, for believing in me and giving me a sense of belonging. When I moved to Grinsby after dealing with the death of my mum and many other challenges, it was fate meeting the amazing group. All my life, I have been told I am no, I am no good, and I, and I believed it. We're suffering with mental health and dyslexia. And I am now a proud own, author of my poems. Thank you, Josie, for everything you do. We are truly grateful. And now I will introduce you to the amazing, lovely Josie Moon from East Marsh United, Grinsby. <laughs> Thank you very much Kelly that was a beautiful introduction and I also am absolutely delighted to be here this evening to speak to you all so I'm Josie Moon from the East Marsh of Grimsby and the East Marsh is a multiply deprived ward it was built in the 1860s to house the workforce that served the docks and the fishing industry the community was strong and proud until it experienced the hollowing out that happens when an industry ends and nothing comes to replace it since fishing ended, the East Marsh has suffered in so many ways. The sell-off of social housing and the so-called boom of the 90s saw many landlords buying up cheap property as investment. However, many found themselves unable to reap a return. And the result is neglected, abandoned and boarded up houses. Residents in poor quality rented homes often find themselves with absentee or rogue landlords. Repairs and maintenance are just not carried out. The houses are over 150 years old, built on a drained marsh. Damp is prolific, narrow alleys, fly tipping, wheelie bins on the streets, no front gardens, mean that our community is dirty, unhealthy, and can feel unsafe and unwelcoming. Add to this austerity, low achievement in education, limited opportunities for work, and what you have is a community facing the condition of poverty where lack of resources make life endlessly hard. East Marsh United, EMU, was born out of crisis in 2017 when county line drug gangs took over our streets and used violence and intimidation to force people out of their homes and coerce them into becoming drug couriers. It was chaos. Concerned citizens came together and realized that if change was going to happen, they were going to have to lead it and make the change they wanted to see. And that's exactly what they did. So fast forward to 2023, and EMU has grown in a multitude of ways. We're an ethical social landlord, currently with 10 homes refurbished to a high standard and further houses undergoing refurbishment to let next year. Our tenants are treated with respect and empathy and are offered support beyond the bricks and mortar in which they live. Our aim is to have 100 houses for 100 years, a vision to create a more settled and cohesive community for the long term and, importantly, a sustainable ethical revenue stream for the organisation to become fully autonomous. We are greening our concrete streets. We planted 30 trees in our park this year and have a further 60 trees to plant next winter in our streets, lifting our ward canopy cover, which stands presently at just 7%. We have a piece of land undergoing development and that's going to become our community growing space. So what about our creative practice then? Well, it's not an add-on or a luxury. 
It's integrated into everything that we do, into the joyful and imaginative vision we have for transforming our East Marsh into a more settled, safe and healthy community. Our Peace Choir sings together every week, currently rehearsing for our winter concert. Our writing group meets weekly and we are producing a version of Dick Whittington. Oh no, we're not. <laughs> our, our first production from our emerging intergenerational theatre company. We've just opened a toy library for our little citizens and we've got Opera North coming to join us in the spring to work with our seven local schools. We're thinking generationally, honouring those behind us, our East Marsh ancestors, while being present for our community today and planting seeds for years ahead. In our turn, we will become good ancestors. Robert Tressel wrote in The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist in the early 20th century, every man who is not helping to bring about a better state of affairs for the future is helping to perpe perpetuate the present misery and is therefore the enemy of his own children. There is no such thing as being neutral. So we work with partners and allies in common cause to make life better, fairer and kinder. Our partners range from the hyper-local to the national, and we constantly reach out to make connections with those who share our values and our vision. EMU is a national pathfinder organization supported by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, working with other innovators across our country to challenge the status quo, <coughs> to think and behave radically, and to fight for a fairer future for all. Creativity is central to this. Creative, engaged citizens are healthier, happier, and experience an overall better quality of life than those who are isolated and trapped by the grinding fear that poverty brings. We live in a time where the world feels overwhelming, where the dark is creeping in at every edge. If this is to change, we must imagine a better world and work to bring it about. That means being brave, taking risks and challenging the status quo because it just will not do. We can all be good ancestors. We can all fight the dark and seek the light. And it sounds idealistic because it is, but where would we be without our ideals? I'll finish with a verse from Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ring Out Wild Bells because it seems apt for the season and for our current context. Ring out false pride in place and blood, the civic slander and the spite. Ring in the love of truth and right. Ring in the common love of good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jason Kelly, and I forgot to put up Kelly's slide, <laughs> so I'm going to put it up now. Your work is absolutely inspirational. I'm sure everyone in the room feels that. But also to say that Kelly is one of a group of people with lived experience who we commissioned to make artistic responses to the creative re uh, review process. And you can see them all on the National Centre for Creative Health website. And also when we do go into the workshop later, they'll be screened then. So now I'd like to introduce Gemma O'Brien. Gemma spoke at our round table on mental health and told us about her experiences of the Horsefall at 42nd Street in Manchester, a creative space and gallery for young people experiencing mental health challenges. Gemma then went on to join our lived experience panel who have been contributing to the development of the report and the recommendations. And we're delighted that Gemma is able to join us this evening. Thanks so much for introducing me, Alex, and for inviting me here today. I feel incredibly privileged to be invited to speak. Um, my name is Gemma. I'm a 25-year-old, five-foot northerner and proud Mancunian. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think of myself as being a mix between an artist, researcher and change maker, and I'm particularly interested in person-centred and inclusive approaches to understanding the diverse lived experience of creative health. 
I'm a person with lived experience of using creativity to enhance my mental health myself. And while I take the box of having said lived experience, I always like to emphasize that I identify as being much more than this alone. I'm a first class graduate in human geography. And last year I conducted a piece of community research at a wonderful mental health charity in Manchester called 42nd Street, which has its own creative venue called The Horse Ball. At 42nd Street, I conducted a piece of research which produced a toolkit containing 12 effective components for best practice in non-prescriptive creative health. And the outputs of this have since been applied to alternative spaces such as CAMs, schools and shopping centres. At 42nd Street, I've also been the Associate Director of a campaign festival and symposium advocating for young people's right to a creative life. And for anyone in the audience interested in health equity like above, I've been a reviewer, panellist and I'm now an advisor on an AHRC project called Mobilising Community Assets to Tackle Health Inequalities. However, most recently, I moved to the big smoke that is London and joined a graduate programme at the Wellcome Trust, five stops down the Northern Line Bank branch. <laughs> <laughs> Why focus on creative health? As I stand here today, a said person with lived experience, as much as I'd love to share with you a fairy tale or happily ever after, claiming that after painting 25 canvases, I was miraculously discharged from inpatient hospital, no longer depressed or grieving the loss of my best friends. Unfortunately, I feel this would be a wildly simplistic assertion to make. So sadly, for the likes of Hobbycraft or Cass Arts, well, I'm not going to market to you that creativity is the new Citalopram or CBT. What I can tell you is that what creativity means to me, why it works and stresses absolute vitality as we face a dualistic crisis of rocketing waiting lists and mental health referrals. While it's hardly an accolade, I do consider myself to be a bit of a connoisseur when it comes to accessing mental health services, in that I've dabbled with varying success in a broad spectrum of what is offered. And when I initially, <laughs> maybe three years ago, when I initially found out 42nd Street offered a creative programme, while intrigued, my automatic response was that a creative intervention for my mental health was the equivalent of sticking a wet paper towel on depression, in that it was both an action that would give me something to do, but it wouldn't necessarily make me feel better. So if you're in the audience and you're feeling slightly sceptical or unconvinced about the value of a creative health strategy, I can assure you I was once there myself. Um, next slide. While doubtful, without access to more traditional forms of care, I began using the creative space at 42nd Street, engaging in workshops and over time co-created an art exhibition which sought to enliven the lived experience of mental illness beyond its stigma and stereotypes. In doing so, art became not just an action, but it allowed me to feel and process experiences. The outputs enabling me to advocate for change. The process of using creativity to connect with and influence others inspired me to create this participatory art space map. This map illustrates over 100 young people safe spaces in Manchester. And while the output is this huge illustrated map, unlike rigid models of therapy, which follow a fixed program of talking through difficult experiences or planning the practicing of skills between sessions, this shine a light mapping project catered for my own individual needs it not only allowed me the reflective time I needed to process the loss of one of my closest friends, albeit through smiles, laughs, the occasional tear or angry moment, but it also gave me a sense of joy and empowerment, cultivating a sense of agency and skill set that has taken me from an inpatient revolving door to resilient and thriving. In contrast to more standardised models, this project allowed me to self-prescribe the project which I needed, and in doing so, this became the recipe for my recovery. Um, my interest in how creativity can indeed become a recipe for recovery drove me to start a community research project at 42nd Street. The project aimed to evidence if creative spaces improve young people's well-being. And despite academic glorification of outcome measures, the research <laughs> has to be sad. <laughs> The research was ethnographic in nature and focused on creative methods of working collaboratively alongside young people to understand why these spaces work. While the outputs don't state that creative spaces increases, increase a young person's well-being from a score of three to nine, 
The research brought attention to the fact that creativity for many young people is a lifeline, the best thing they've ever done for their mental health, or as making their mental health 10 times better than any other intervention. Not only this, but the analysis made visible 12 affecting components or ingredients that take place within a creative space, which are both evidenced and valued by young people. Um, spotlighting that in addition to being an action or opportunity to process, creative health encompasses freedom, belonging, validation, agency, and social connection, and it becomes both a safe and accessible space in a world of waiting, inaccessibility and inequality. While everyone involved discussed each of these components playing a part in their creative health journey in different ratios, this highlights that unlike standardised approaches, the flexibility of a creative model focus on what works for who and why, attending to the diversity of needs young people have and the different pathways which recovery can follow. And this emphasises my earlier point, a non-prescriptive creative space allows young people the freedom to self-prescribe a project which becomes their own unique recipe for recovery. A creative space not only mitigates a two-year waiting list, but the skills and agency people develop through creative health begins to transform people's dialect around mental illness from one of being unwell and unable to do things to being an active agent in their own recovery. And every single person I've spoken to has expressed a desire for more. Hence why I chose to be a part of the Creative Health Review and its person-centered and collaborative nature of the round tables, its lived experience panel and the recommendations made has meant it's only been a privilege to be a part of, and I really mean that. It's one of the most authentic lived experience panels and pieces of work that I've ever done. I live and breathe this work. Um, Next slide, sorry. Um, so despite thinking creativity was the equivalent of sticking a wet paper towel on my mental health three years ago. Three months ago, on my first day at Welcome, when I was asked what I would bring if I was stuck on a desert island in a perhaps less than creative icebreaker, <laughs> my automatic response was to bring my watercolors. <laughs> so I believe when it comes down to it, Creative health is mental health. It's fundamental to my survival, but it's also fundamental to the survivals of those dependent on our healthcare system today. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. That was absolutely brilliant, as you can hear. Quite a hard act to follow. <laughs> OK, so um, moving on, we now have um, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, one of our commissioners. As many of you know, Professor Marmot has been hugely influential in this country and around the world with his research into health inequalities and promotion of health equity. And we have been incredibly privileged to have him as a commissioner on the Creative Health Review. Over to you, Michael. As you said, several hard acts to follow. <laughs> <coughs> um, in 1931, John Maynard Keynes wrote an essay, the um, possibilities for our grandchildren. He predicted that we would get really rich. He got one part really correct. He said that the gross domestic product per person would be sixfold by 2030. Pretty close. But then he went on to say, we would only need to work 15 hours a week. Anybody recognize that? <laughs> We'd only need to work 15 hours a week and the rest would be for leisure and creative activities. Being John Maynard Keynes, I think he was thinking about opera and um, the Royal Ballet, uh, creative activities. Uh, one other thing he got wrong was he didn't think about inequality. 
he thought about the averages. Actually, I think he thought about high status people like him. And I quoted, I think it's at the end of the report, I was looking for my quote. Um, I quoted in the report, a few years later, Bertrand Russell um, said, the idea that the poor should have leisure has always been shocking to the rich. <laughs> now, fast forward to 2010 and what's happened over the last dozen years, 13 years. In all the political discussion, how much have you heard about leading a life of dignity? How much have you heard about leading a life of creativity and meaning? What we've heard is we've got a cut. We're living beyond our means. We've missed out on our credit card. There's shirkers and strivers, hardworking families. What about quality of life? What about meaning? What about purpose? If the sole purpose of our political project is to see if we can reduce debt as a proportion of gross domestic product, we're missing something really bad. And I'm not just an old fogey. I'm a young, no, I'm not a young fogey. I'm a young, <laughs> I'm a young progressive. That's what I am. <laughs> and I know we've been getting it wrong because as many of you will know, I've been documenting the fact that our health stopped improving. Our health inequalities have got bigger. Health for the poorest people has got worse. Can you imagine that? Life expectancy for the poorest people outside London has gone down. That implied promise that society will get better all the time has been broken. And what are we going to do about it? Not simply say, yes, there'll be more low paid jobs available and you'll have to work two jobs um, to try and make ends meet. The whole point for me of creative health is saying that it's very much about the quality of life. It's very much about dignity and purpose and meaning and what gives life its richness. We know about the cost of living crisis. We know about families wearing two overcoats indoors to stay warm, to cancel a children's birthday party because of lack of money, to have 22% of families with children in food insecurity. Where does creativity come in there? I think we should think about basic needs the Joseph Roundtree Foundation talked about six basic needs. They missed out one, creativity, quality of life. They talked about housing, heating, light, food, clothing, toiletries, 3.8 million people in 2022, including 1 million children, did without two or more of those six. What about creativity? What about meaning and purpose? We don't expect government to create creativity for you, but we do expect government to provide the opportunities, to provide the facilities within which people can be creative. That means making sure you can eat and you can buy toothpaste and soap this is what we're talking about in 2022. A million children living in households where they can't afford soap and toothpaste. But man and woman don't live by toothpaste alone. <laughs> and the whole rationale of creative health 
is actually dealing with that fundamental dimension of who we are, of what it means to be a person. So yes, there are good recommendations in the report about what the healthcare service should do and others. But what I want us to do is to rethink what it means to live in society. What is our purpose? What do we want the politics to deliver? And we want the politics to deliver the opportunity for people to live lives they have reason to value. And as you've just heard, creative endeavors can be a crucial part of leading a life you have reason to value. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And it is amazing to have somebody of Michael's reputation supporting this endeavor. Um, and now we have another extremely well-known speaker, Monty Don, who is the UK's leading garden writer and broadcaster. Again, it has, oh, oh, I've got you up there, sorry. <laughs> um, again, it has been a huge pri privilege to have Monty as a commissioner on the Creative Health Review, and we have benefited greatly from his profound insight and commitment to this agenda. Thank you, Monty. afternoon. I want to tell you a story. Imagine it's spring. Difficult, I know, but just, just go there. It's a lovely early April day. It's just warming up. The sort of day when you can take your jersey off for the first time and feel the sunshine. Now this story is about a 17 year old boy. And he's troubled. He's been expelled from two schools. He's fighting everybody and everything. He doesn't know what he wants, but he knows what he doesn't want. He's mixing with the wrong people. He's drinking, but he can't hold his drink. He's taking bad drugs and he hasn't got a girlfriend because he doesn't know how to get a girlfriend. But he does know a little bit about gardening. And he comes back from school and goes outside and starts to sow some carrot seeds and he prepares the ground and he feels the sun on his back and he makes a fine tilth in the soil and he pours the seed into his hand and suddenly is filled with a kind of sublime joy, a sense that fundamentally all is well. And he has no idea what this means. No idea what to do with that knowledge. And then that night, he has a dream that his fingers grow down into the soil and become roots, and grow deep and deep and deep down. And when he wakes in the morning, he's gained a kind of new trust in himself, in the earth, and although he doesn't quite know where it will take him, that remains. Now, of course, that boy was me, 50 years. And I have spent the rest of my life using the earth, not the abstract idea, but the ground, the soil, the dirt, everything beneath your feet, using it to heal myself. I suffered from, from bouts of profound depression all my life. Uh, I remember going to see uh, a herbalist in the 80s, having tried all signs of doctors. And he fed me various vile liquids and I would go in and he would say, how are you feeling? And I said, well, I'm spotty, my hair's falling out. I said, marvellous, he'd say, it's all working. All the toxins are coming out. And um, after a bit, I went to see him. He said, well, I've got the answer. I know how to cure you. Fine. What? He said, give up your job and go and work on the land. Now, at that time, I employed 20 people. I had a shop in Beecham Place. And to all outward appearances, I was very successful. I said, I can't. He said, fine, close the door behind you. I can do nothing more. And of course, he was absolutely right. 
Now, not everybody needs to devote their lives to gardening. I just happen to be lucky. But my guess is everybody can benefit from having access to a garden, to green space, to trees, to wind, to rain, to light, to sun. And that is part of our national health, our social health, and an area which I'm profoundly interested in for reasons that, that complicated mental health. And during lockdown, it was extraordinary how people discovered the magic of their domestic outdoor lives, how nature literally came to their doorstep. We have become a society that associates uh, a kind of hierarchy of grandeur with nature. If it's a snow leopard, by definition, it's better than the cat that sits on the wall. If it's, if it's a killer whale, then it's about 10 notches up from goldfish. But the truth is during lockdown, suddenly people looked around and had time to spend in their gardens, however modest. And if, you know, bearing in mind that, that millions of people don't have a garden, but actually in this country, still over 80% do have a garden. And the benefits of that were profound at a time when the mental stresses of lockdown were, as we're increasingly discovering, profound. And I was working today with somebody who lives on a fourth floor flat, uh, and he didn't even have a view. He just had his one hour outside, had no access to green space at, at all, other than walking for about a quarter of a mile until he came to a park. Now, the reason that I agreed to take part in this report, and I had great doubts, because to be honest, I'm very cynical about politicians. I'm not even convinced that anything that is said today, anything that we've talked about over the last year will be paid any attention by politicians. And I'm a great believer though in the groundswell of the public. I really believe that if everybody does a little, you can achieve great things. And I am absolutely certain that a healthy society, not one which attempts to cure illness, but one attempts to create health, is one that provides and encourages and informs access to the natural world, skills in how to create it. And gardens don't exist to make you well. Gardens exist to make something beautiful. They are works of art. It is a creative process. I was president of the Soil Association for many years, and we ran a, a food for life system where we encourage children at schools to grow vegetables, to teach them how to cook it. And really what we discovered was the most important thing, they taught their parents how to cook it. So families started to share. And this process of sharing, of bonding, doctors are now increasingly prescribing uh, green, prescriptions and medicine. And we, we know from very good evidence that people's anxiety and depression and loneliness is dramatically improved simply with a few hours in a garden with other people, looking after plants, investing in a future that works to a natural rhythm. You put a seed in the ground and it will grow. You plant a bulb, and next spring, there will be a flower. And that rhythm of hope, that rhythm of trust, has to be part of our health. And if today, if over the last year, if this report encourages an awareness of that, and maybe encourages people just to do a little, and quite frankly, bugger the politicians. <laughs> make, make the movement forward. If all that happens, then our time has been well spent. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. We don't have many politicians in the room. Um, <laughs> some and um, and they're all very busy in the house of commons <laughs> okay well thank you very much that was wonderful and all the speakers were wonderful what an inspiring um nearly hour we've now got a break
and um, please feel free obviously to get up and move around. So welcome you all back. I want to say how grateful I am to Kelly and Josie and Gemma for the wonderful talks that they gave to us earlier. They spoke with the authority of their experience. Monty talked about groundswell. Well, there you saw groundswell in action and very impressive and very powerful and very moving it was. I also want to thank Michael, Michael Marmot, um, for his passionate speech, his passion for justice, all the work he's done over so many years to provide the evidence about health inequalities and his unwavering determination to make sure that this evidence is not ignored, that it is absorbed and responded to by, by policymakers. They shouldn't be afraid of his generous anger. They should welcome the, 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 the directions in which he points them. And thanks too to Monty, Monty Don, because uh, he overcame his reluctance, his skepticism to become a commissioner. He's been a really remarkable member of the commission, as you can imagine, having heard him talk. And he gave us uh, such a powerful address just now. Skeptical he may be about politicians, but I thank him for his blessing. And uh, of, of course he's right that the groundswell is in the end what matters. The, the will of the people is what matters, but we need both. We do need a response from on high. We need a response from government. We need a response, not just from the politicians, but the, from the professional establishment. And it's not easy to get politicians and, and clinical professionals and the vast bureaucracies that over which they preside to respond and adapt. But that is what we have to do because otherwise the groundswell will continue to be frustrated. Anyway, I now want to, to welcome and introduce Lola, Baroness Lola Young of Hornsey and our panel of commissioners. Lola has been a, a wonderful friend and ally to the creative health movement, certainly over all the years since we began the inquiry in, 20, in 2015. And she too has been a super commissioner. And I am most grateful to you, Lola, for for, for chairing the panel this afternoon. Um, Tracy Crouch, my co-chair of the all-party group, is, is very, very sorry indeed. She can't be here this afternoon. She's on a three-line whip in the House of Commons, which she, she can't escape. But um, I'm so pleased that four of our commissioners, Professor Martin Marshall, James Sanderson, Rob Webster, and Alice Wiseman, who, uh, Three of the four of them have certainly traveled very long distances to be here with us today, have agreed to form a panel representative of our commission and to discuss and to debate some, some questions and issues that Lola, I think, plans to raise with them. So I look forward to that and thank you all. Well, um, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here this, this afternoon, and I'm pleased to be here too. Um, it's, uh, I must say that Alan was very, very generous about my contribution to the Commission because for various reasons I wasn't able to contribute and participate in the way I would have liked to. And therefore I feel sort of extra honoured to be asked to help to present some of these issues that arise from this uh, this afternoon with our distinguished uh, panel. I was involved a little bit, um, as, as Alan said, 2015, which you know so feels like a long time ago. And I think that's partly because of the pandemic. So what was meant to be, I think in some of our minds, a real reset after the pandemic, after lockdown, and all of the issues that came out of that, particularly around health inequalities, 
uh, as far as I was concerned, that was one of the major, major things that was brought into view, not that there hadn't been there before, but that was brought into um, a vivid view for everybody. And that I was hoping, and I would hope, because I too can be critical of politicians. Um, I'm a parliamentarian rather than a politician. So, um, you know, I was hoping that there would be, you know, a really strong response for this. But I think the issue is that anybody who does any campaigns will understand that you have to keep on finding ways around um, the obstacles in your path. And that's something that I hope we'll, we'll get to this afternoon. Now, you've got um, uh, everybody's bios, uh, I think, within the uh, wonderful uh, report, very beautiful report and full of really, really important um, things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each commissioner in turn to initially say a little bit about themselves and why they got involved. Now, I know that some have already covered some of this, so we might probe a little bit more on that and sort of think about some uh, specifics, drill down a little bit. And then, and then we'll go into a couple of questions which are about barriers or about obstacles and how, how we can address those, but also how we can address the opportunities and not lose sight of the different ways in which we might be able to achieve what we want to achieve um, uh, without politicians or by circumventing them in particular ways. Um, uh, but anyway, we've, we've made huge progress over the years, but clearly still there's a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of that journey is left to be able to persuade people in those powerful positions that they really need to take this seriously. So I'm going to start, I think, with you, James, if you would just say briefly a little bit about yourself and then tell us how you got to be engaged with this and why you think it's important. Thanks, Sona. Um, good afternoon. I'm not sure whether the mic's working, but I, can you hear me in the back? Um, so um, good afternoon. Um, is it working it's working now yes um good evening everybody um it's great to be here and um what a fantastic um day that we've um, now got this uh, report out there um my my passion for this has um always been there and um i'm um the director of community health services and personalized care um, for nhs england um and one of the things that we've been working on for a number of years now is the development of social prescribing um, which uh, at its heart is all about, as Sir Michael was saying, about creating um, meaning, purpose, um, connection for people in their lives. And if people have those things, if people have activity, we, we find that people achieve good outcomes for their health and well-being. And um, it's really pleasing that we now have over two million people that have been supported through connection to arts and culture and activities like sports and nature through social prescribing. Um, and we really want to do more work in this space. Thank you, Martin. So, uh, hi, I'm Martin Marshall. I'm a, a GP by background and a, uh, an academic, a clinical academic with an interest in researching how to improve the NHS, which is a job that keeps you going for a long period of time. Uh, <laughs> I, I can assure you. So, we've had some beautiful poems today, and I just want to I want to cite a poem to you. Um, um, it, and it goes something like: um, Physicians of the utmost fame were called at once, but when they came. They answered as they took their fees, there is no cure for this disease. <laughs> that was Hilaire Belloc, of course. And the reason, the reason, the reason I uh, say that to you is it, it kind of demonstrates um, how, um, uh, how little there was you could do as a doctor in the old days in order to improve patient care. Now that's changed dramatically as a GP working in the East End of London. So many interventions that I have at my disposal that can be really, really effective. But, this is a big but, they're not half as effective as we pretend they are. So let's look at something like someone with blood pressure, really high, uh, high prevalence problem, high blood pressure. Um, my job as a GP is to prescribe uh, antihypertensives. Um, so, uh, so that's what I do. The evidence, however, from a very interesting study is that only about half of the blood pressure drugs that I prescribe are actually um, taken to the chemist. Half of those are taken properly and half of those work. So there's me thinking that I'm making a massive difference to somebody's blood pressure. It's not happening at all. And similarly, um, I had a wonderful lady who I looked after, a middle-aged woman um, who had quite severe um, clinical depression. After a long conversation, she decided to take Prozac and she got better, which is a brilliant, brilliant triumph of modern medicine. Um, except about a year later, she came back to me and she said, Dr. Marshall, I never actually took those tablets you prescribed me. And what she did was she put them in her husband's coffee <laughs> because she figured that it was her husband who was depressed and he's the one who needed treatment. So, the reason that I say this to you is 
is as a GP, as a GP, I'm always looking for more effective interventions. Um, and there's no doubt at all that in the creative health space, I found loads of them. So as a GP, I refer, I refer my patients to um, group swimming classes um, to uh, help them to lose weight. I refer them to singing lessons when they've got a lung, lung disease. Uh, I refer uh, uh, people who've got, who are obese with type two diabetes to cooking lessons. So there's a whole range of things that I do and they are fundamentally, um, uh, I think based originally on my optimism that they might work, but increasingly based on evidence. And I, I'm sorry, Gemma, I am a hard scientist. Um, so uh, I look at the data and the data suggests that these things really do make a significant difference. So that's why I got involved. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting uh, story there about the wife and her treatment of her husband. I'm not sure whether that should be referred to the criminal justice system. <laughs> um, Monty, so, so you've covered some of this. Yeah, I, I, I won't bore you with, with repeating what I've already said. Um, but I think the thing that motivates me in, in all this discussion uh, is really two things. One, that our whole approach to health, the National Health Service, is about dealing with illness and sickness. And although we do increasingly talk about well-being and wellness, there's a kind of um, sort of slick lifestyle approach to it. I, I read a lot of the papers every day, and there's, you know, 10 ways to, to tighten your abs or 10 ways to, to, to prepare yourself for skiing so you're, you're sort of bottom is very tight or something like that. Um, and, and we were talking about this, is that we've slightly lost the sense that health is a natural state. Health is the ordinary state, not that we should aspire to, not that we should be more healthy than someone else and, and be able to do things in a measurably better way, but actually it is part of living a full life. Uh, and as Michael said, you know, as richly as possible, it is part of our birthright. So I, I, I feel very strongly about that. And I, my family has had lots of ill health um, and has had to deal with that in many ways. The other thing is that apart from my own sort of mental health problems, uh, a member of my family is very seriously ill with mental health problems and it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. And you know, we tried everything, the resources aren't there, it's socially, it's a nightmare, in, in every way, it's just kind of hell. And one of the things we need to do is to create a world, but certainly a, a, a society that we can relate to. And this is where actually I can make glib remarks about politicians, but it's gonna need politicians to do this, is we have to improve our mental health facilities. And if, working with gardens, with plants, with outside, does anything to help that, then I'm signing up. Thank you very much indeed. And, and we will return on, on some of these issues again. But Rob, I mean, one of the things that struck me, particularly about what Monty was just saying, is this issue around mental health. And also <coughs> in particular, men's mental health. And I wondered whether that was an area in which you would want to say something, but also along with your, your sort of enthusiasm for this particular project. Yeah, sure. So uh, hello, everybody. My name's Rob. I'm the chief executive of NHS West Yorkshire. Uh, we're an integrated care system that supports a population of about two and a half million people. Uh, I've been introduced, uh, interested in this agenda for a very long time. Uh, worked with Dr. Charles Alessi 20 years or so ago, or he introduced me to the idea of salutogenesis. You know, you've got pathogens which make you sick and pathogenics uh, is something we're always interested in, but what makes you well? Why don't we talk about salutogenesis? The things that make you well, that keep you well. And uh, from that kind of intellectual framing, my, sort of my lived experience, my experience as a chief executive in the NHS, have been a bit like Martin's really. It's the things that help keep you, uh, your physical, mental and social needs being met that we should support. And uh, Deb Steele, who's in the audience, once stood up at a session I was at and talked about how Creative Health and Creative Minds, one of the programs that we uh, led in my uh, trust, had not just saved a life, but had gave her a life. And, uh, you know, as people were called human beings, aren't we? we're not called human doings. 
Mm. What we do, it's how we are, it's who we are. It's uh, man's search for meaning, as Viktor Frankl would have it, is incredibly important. So I think I've I've seen throughout my my career, 33, or 33 years now in the health and care system, that this stuff is fundamental. Uh, as Michael says, you know, what do we what do we want from our lives and our society if we're going to be well and if we're unwell? that we can thrive and survive. Like Gemma's story, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't have a poem, I don't think. I think the only poem I could think of <laughs> uh, might actually be relevant. Is it Spike Milligan said, Dr. Odell fell down the well, breaking his collarbone, but doctors should attend to the sick and leave the well alone. <laughs> It's a great, great selection of poetry this afternoon as an added bonus. Um, Michael, if I may, so um, I know you, you talked extensively in, in your previous comments. I'm just wondering, are there any particular points that you could identify where you'd say policymakers and politicians could really, really need to be persuaded that um, it is something that is really fundamental. We're not talking about a luxury here. We're talking about something which is absolutely fundamental. And it always strikes me that particularly around arts and culture and horticulture, this is something human beings have done since, since we stood up. You know, so, so why is it seen as something that's um, unnecessary and a bit of a, a frivolous thing, particularly when it can have so many benefits? Sorry, a lot of questions and comments tied up there. In case you hadn't noticed, I have an obsession with inequalities in health. <laughs> and consistent with what Monty said, my whole approach to it is the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, the social determinants of health, and inequities in power, money, and resources that give rise to those inequities in the conditions of daily life. And I've been saying for a long time that one of the important gateways by which the social environment impacts on health is the mind. Um, Woody Allen says it's the body's second most interesting organ. I think it's the most interesting. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that counts as my poem. <laughs> so free verse. I think free that verse. Yeah. Um, and is the mind. And it means mental health is absolutely vital and psychosocial pathways to physical health. In work I was doing in India, I came across the example of economists tearing their hair out because a poor family, instead of investing in another cow, which might have increase their prosperity long term, use the money to invest in their daughter's wedding. And the economist said, this makes no sense. You could maximize your util rational choice theory, maximize your utility, da, 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 da. complete and utter garbage. <laughs> What's more important to this family? Their daughter's wedding is the most important thing for this family. And if we think that it's just about material resources, we're missing something absolutely fundamental, absolutely fundamental. As I said, material resources are very important, crucial, but we were chatting in the break. I'm not signed up to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't think that first you need to get the basics and then you can think about self-actualization. Absolutely not. You need to care about your daughter's wedding, whether you've got enough food to eat or not. You need to be thinking, what am I as a person, whether you've got enough food or not? And what am I as a person is part of the social relationships of being involved in cultural activities, the enrichment, of the mind and dare I say it, the soul. That's, you don't hear too many epidemiologists talking about the soul. Um, we can't write papers <laughs> talking about the soul. But um, th these are absolutely vital activities. And to then come back to your question, of, yeah, what would I want politicians to, to do? I, I never want to hear again 
that when a local authorities had its budget cut by 42%, they say, well, I'm sorry, we had to close the libraries and the leisure mm. centers and the creative activities. All the other things local government does is vital, but so are the libraries and the leisure centers and the creative activities. That's what living in a civilized society should mean. Yeah, I'm totally, totally with you on this. And I think that that sort of focus on the material is what is it sort of enveloped us in this commodification of wellness. So in order to be well, you need to spend the 150 pounds on this and whatever. So it's almost kind of corrupted what that term means. And I think maybe that's also part of the scary thing for some politicians or for many pol politicians, I would say, because it's quite revolutionary to say it's not all about money. And it is sometimes about the wedding and not the cow, which I think is a great um, uh, story to tell. And Alice, I wanna to come to you now. You've been very patient waiting there. And we did meet on Zoom or Teams or whatever it was, but not in person, so hi again. Um, what, what, what's your view on why you got involved in this and what you think some of the benefits are of participating for you personally and professionally, as well as more broadly? Um, thank you. Um, so aside from never saying no to Lord Howarth <laughs> <laughs> and being involved in the first review that he did in, in 2017 at the latter, in the latter stages, um, in my day job, I've got a statutory responsibility to do whatever I can to protect and promote the health and well-being of the population I serve. Um, which is in Gateshead in the northeast of England. Um, I still find it entirely shocking that two babies born today in Gateshead can have as much as a 10 year difference in life expectancy due entirely to the circumstances into which they're born. Um, and despite much amazing work, you know, within our NHS over many decades, inequalities, as Sir Michael has already described, an entirely preventable disease remain stubbornly persistent. Um, and I, I, in fact, as Sir Michael showed us as we went into the pandemic, uh, life expectancy stalling for the first time in 100 years. And actually, for those in the most disadvantaged communities, life expectancy, you know, inequalities are, are growing. And that's certainly something that we're seeing playing out now in my local area. So taking it back to, to why is that when you look at the things that um, enable and create health and well-being, it's only the NHS, albeit the most amazing um, you know, I think one of our ICS leaders called it the, the eighth wonder of the world. Actually, population health outcomes are only 10 to 20 percent created by our NHS. So our, our system is severely limited at the moment by its disproportionate focus on treating illness when it occurs, as opposed to creating the conditions which enable health and well-being across the life course, as Sir Michael's already said. In the Northeast, we're really fortunate. We have some of the highest performing NHS in the country, but we still have some of the poorest health outcomes. So actually, there is a real push for me to say we must do something different here, not only because the health and well-being of our populations necessitate, necessitate that, but actually I think the survival of our NHS does too. We're seeing increasing demand on NHS services, and we're not going to be able to see that into the future. So we need to find a different way of doing this. And, and I'll, I'm going to sit next to Sir Michael and quote something, so apologies if I get this wrong, but... There was a quote that really resonates for me that Sir Michael gave, which is why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. And actually, there is something for me about the way that we do that at the moment. And I sit here as the director of public health in Gateshead, but also as a parent of an 18 year old who's been sectioned three times in the last 12 months. I have permission to share his story, so I'm not saying anything without his permission. But actually, when he was discharged from hospital after bouncing around many different services, there was nothing in the community that was provided for him that has enabled him to stay and remain well and healthy. And so for me, as well as professionally wanting to challenge this and needing to do this, because it's the responsibility I have with my role as, a, as an individual, as a parent, I really want to make sure that this is right for the future generations, because actually treating somebody with a pill and sending them back out again without any support and, and opportunity to engage in, 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 in a positive way in, in communities, I think is, is completely wrong. And all we're doing is treating people and sending them back to the conditions that made them sick. Yes. Um, 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 yeah. There's so much I want to say um, and uh, that, that's arisen from what all of you have said. But I was uh, um, something was brought to my mind 
by something you said, Michael, about, and it's about the wedding and the cow thing, which I can't sort of get out of my mind now, but it was, it's really important because I hosted a meeting um, uh, a few weeks ago, a group of black women who approached me to talk about the menopause and black women. Right, and you, so I think from their experiences, a lot of the doctors that they approach just kind of assume that the menopause is the menopause is the menopause without taking on board those psychosocial experiences which feed into, and cultural, which feed into the way you think about those things. So what did they do? The, the, the doctor, black woman who was working with them, she held a weekend in, in a nice house where people did their nails and their eyebrows and their hair, of course. And um, when you hear those women speak afterwards, you understand what a difference just that weekend makes. Now, it's not, some of it was also overtly cultural as well. It's about writing poetry and stories and what have you. So this, as a, it's a kind of way of saying there's so much evidence, both anecdotal and actually kind of, you know, quantitative and qualitative evidence what is it that is stopping policymakers and politicians from really taking this on? Because in the end, see, it's such a short term view because, I mean, we don't want to offer the arts and culture as a panacea for all uh, society's ills and, and illnesses. But it, is, it just seems to me such a simple concept that we're talking about. Why is it that there is this resistance? Would any, any of you like to tackle that as a question? Go on, Michael. Michael, and then well, Mark, Mark, I, I get asked Ron. versions of that question, Ron. Um, it was at lunch today. Is anybody listening to you? Is the question I get asked it all the time, and the, and the, the people asking the question are implicitly talking about the politicians in Westminster. Mm. In fact, the current government, and the, the reason I spend a lot of my time smiling is because politicians are listening. They're in cities and places and local government. They're in Scotland, they're in Wales. I was in Belfast last week, the mood in the room varied from utter despair to yes, we can, um, and everything in between. But uh, politicians working at the city and local level are very susceptible mm. to these arguments. They are listening. They're cut off at the knees, by the funding settlements, I mean, leveling up is, I was gonna say a sick joke. There's nothing funny about it. Um, it's humiliating that we should be uh, subjected to such amazing nonsense. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> IPPR North calculated that the leveling up fund for 2021 in the North amounted to 33 pounds per person. The amount of money cut out of local government in the north amounted to 430 pounds per year. So leveling up, yeah, politicians in the north would love to do this. They are open to it. They're not resistant, but we've got to create the conditions to make that possible. Thank you. I think, Rob, you wanted to say something? Yeah, in a similar vein, I think that um, got to challenge ourselves. Are we are we failing to take the space that's available because we want somebody to give us permission? Because we don't need it. And uh, you know, in West Yorkshire, we've been we've had creative health as one of our strategic priorities since we started working as a system in 2016, and we've made progress because we can. And I think one of the things about this agenda is that there's lots of opportunities to connect the system to more of itself, to make connections between people in communities, just as we heard uh, early and so powerfully, uh, people in different sectors, so that, you know, those interactions create something. They themselves are acts of creativity, which create something which create benefit for people, but they also create jobs. And the, the, the idea that we don't have political leadership is a folly. I think Lord Howarth has shown amazing political leadership in this whole process. Our Metro Mayor, Tracy Brabin, she's created a new deal for creative industries. In the last year, we've had a 17% increase in the number of jobs in the creative industries that have been advertised. That's three times the national average uh, because she's got behind the creative industries in West Yorkshire, a little bit of money, uh, a lot of ambition and a lot of connection. And what we're saying in West Yorkshire is it's okay that the mayor's thinking about that through the industrial strategy and as, a, as an economic and a public good, but as a health and care system, we should be connecting to it. Mm. 
because if you're going to socially prescribe something, you have to be able to subscribe, uh, prescribe it to somebody. And if there's nobody on the other end of it, because you don't have leisure centres or gardens or a creative sector, then you're going to be in trouble. So, so I think take the local political uh, leadership, take the space that's available, and don't wait for permission because you don't really need it. Good point. Thank you. Martin? Sorry, I think Rob's absolutely right. There are some great examples of, of, of creative health promotion in different parts of the country. But I don't, I don't have any doubt at all that if politicians were on board, we could make a real step change and we could do it faster. And the issue for me, I think it comes back to Michael's story about, about the car and the wedding. Um, we, we're assuming that politicians are rational beings. <laughs> and if we present evidence that something works and counter evidence that, you know, that where, where it doesn't work, then they'll just take that on board. And for, of course, they're not. They respond to popularism and, and to pressure. The problem that I see at the moment is those of us in this room are the enthusiasts for creative health. And there's not many of us. So if we could get all clinicians, let's say all health professionals, working with their patients, saying that they actually believe the evidence and they can see it working, if we could get that kind of um, uh, pressure, then politicians would start listening. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. At the moment, it's too much of a minority sport. Yes, Monty. Uh, well, it's just, just one point I want to make, listening to this. Uh, we all know that asking the right question is, is more important than getting the right answer. And I, I feel that when it comes to politicians, whether they be national or local, and the truth is most of us know more about our national politicians than our local ones because you work with them, but most of us don't. It's up to us to ask the right questions of our politicians, to demand and vote for people who give us, who answer the questions that we ask, not the questions that they pose. And to a certain extent, we get the politicians we deserve. And I think that we, you know, I, I would look very quick to do it, but I think that it's easy to pass the buck onto politicians when actually we as voters, as members of a society, it has to start. And what I meant when I spoke earlier about groundswell was not that we can bypass the political process, but that we can create it and we create it from the ground up rather than waiting for it to come down to us. Agreed, absolutely. Uh, I think the sentiment uh, around the room is the same. Actually, you know, it is, there are more of us than here, obviously, literally there are more of us than are here, but I also think the mo there are more of us than we think. Um, although I work in a kind of slightly different area most of the time, I'm always amazed at the number of people who come and want to talk about these things and tell us what they're doing and how they're campaigning and how they've had successful campaigns, which have literally changed uh, the way things are done. So I think sometimes maybe we underestimate that power or, or sort of feel that the ballot box is, yes, of course, I would urge everybody to vote all the time as much as, much as they can, but by the same token, it's more than that. It, that is in itself is not sufficient. And I think, you know, sometimes as has been suggested, we can say, well, you know, we want to come to that table rather than saying, well, here's our table and this is what it looks like. And it looks a bit different from your table. And this is how we're going to conduct these things. And I think there is there are there is leeway for maneuvering around some of these um, uh, um, political obstacles that we face. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is open it out to um, everybody um, and um, Nikki, the esteemed Nikki, there's a mic here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right. You've never had a role before. Um, Nikki, our very esteemed um, mic holder, will, will come to you. So if you just put up your hand, and if you if you don't mind saying a little bit about if you've got an organisational affiliation, a little bit about yourself as you speak, and please try and keep it compact so that we can have as many questions. I'll just try and do all those things. There are so many things I want to ask. So, um, hello, uh, amazing. I'm um, Simone. Right, I'm the Chief Executive of 42nd Duke, so I work for Gemma and other wonderful young people like Gemma, um, and I'm a bit of a disciple of uh, Sir Michael. So I just wanted to bring young people back into the room a bit, actually, and also potentially the VCT, if I can kind of cleverly do the two things at once. But obviously, young people don't have the rights of the ballot box, so they don't have the same kind of voice. And I think that we're definitely finding at 42nd Street that the increase in which there is. The increase in young people coming to us for support is exactly as you described, Sir Michael, it's to do with 
and I will be political, the last 13 years of creating increased inequalities in the places that we work, which is impacting on young people and impacting on how, how they're able to live their lives happily. And that is impacting on their mental health and well-being. So there's a definite relationship between the inequalities and intersectional marginalization and discrimination that young people are experiencing and their mental health, right? So I suppose my question is, how do we get young people on this map in terms of creativity? You've heard what Gemma said about how it impacts massively on, on her mental health and well-being. I think there is a bit of a gap with young people because I think people think they get it at school. I think they think that our oh, young people have got the, still got the opportunities to be creative at school. And so they, the, the investment in creativity and mental health isn't there. I mean, the investment in young people's mental health isn't there, is it? But the investment in psychosocial support and creative mental health isn't there at all. And I'm just wondering what we could do with this report. And possibly there's a manifesto come out this week, which I'm sure you're aware of from the Joint Young People's um, Coalition of Mental Health, how we can bring some of that together in, in, uh, to really try and bring that forward for young people so that they see a massive improvement in the support for them in terms of mental health and wellbeing support. <laughs> Alice, might you want to respond to that, please? And then I'll go on to the next question. So if somebody can put up their hand. OK, just yeah. behind you, Nikki. Yeah, I mean, a really great question and, and lots and lots in there. Um, I guess that young people don't vote and they don't have the right to a vote till they're 18, obviously. But actually, they do have the right to have a voice. and They do have the right to have a voice heard. And as a local um, officer, you know, certainly the elected members in Gateshead are always interested in hearing the views and perspectives of young people. So, you know, again, trying to encourage young people to know that they have a right to contact their local elected men member, to ask them for things, to ask them questions, to ask them, you know, what they can and should be doing. And um, to do that though, I do think there needs to be support that's put around young people because, you know, young people do not feel equal, you know, when they walk into a room, you know, a, a, a room like, like, like this. And actually what we need to be saying is that you absolutely have the right to, have a voice and be equal. Um, I was reflecting on the voting bit from earlier on, so sorry, I just picked this up because I do the counting gates head um, each time we have an election. And what really um, saddens me, I think, really, is the fact that I can tell which parts of our community are most disadvantaged by the voter turnout. So those people in the most deprived communities just don't feel there's any point in having a voice. You know, and actually, so again, working with young people and having that opportunity to say that they have a right to a voice and to encourage them to think about the democratic process and the way that they can play into it, influence it. I think that's a really important part of their education, because actually, as much as we can't, you know, we do choose the politicians that represent us. But actually, the more people who will get into the space of voting, the more likely we are to have a voice that we need to have in the right space. And um, Monty Don spoke earlier on about um, a social movement. And I think that this is where young people are really powerful. So I know that my local elected politicians are much more likely to be engaged and listen to the young people than they are to me, you know, talking and providing that advice. So it is about trying to find those roots in, I guess, at a local level um, and then hopefully growing it. There's some great work around um, social movements and young people across the UK. And um, Bite Back was one that struck me early, uh, earlier on around the work that young people are doing to advocate for the food environment, for example, and I just think we need to hear more from, from young people because they are much more powerful in shifting public views, I think, than, than people like myself. Thank you. I'm going to go to, I think you've got the mic there. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Marie Polly. Um, I am mostly known for setting up the social prescribing network and helping social prescribing into the NHS. So I had three points to make, which pick up on a lot of what we've all been speaking about. So we worked to get it into the NHS very quickly by making everyone say the same thing and do the same thing. So there were three things that we said, which was collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And you could focus this report around one or two suggestions and bring the whole world together on this. One thing, for instance, is ensure funding for creative practices in the education system. A, that's cut. B, there's loads of evidence that shows that, firstly, if you prescribe an adult creative approaches to supporting their well-being, their child or children or people they care for are more likely to then take up creative practices. So that then becomes a preventative mental health approach for the young people. But actually, the other really important thing, building on inequalities, and this is work that um, Daisy, who's here, Daisy Fancourt, 
has done is, is looking at the inequality gradients. So if you provide creative approaches in schools, you knock out the inequality gradient completely. Inequalities are not present because everybody gets access. The only people that don't are the ones that are not at school and they need support to be in the education system in a way that's right for them. So just by ensuring everybody gets more creative activity at school, you can make a sea change in the mental health for young people and therefore save billions of pounds going forwards because you are supporting reduction in mental health and they're putting money into the economy and becoming functional people. And the other thing you could do, which would be really helpful, is educate medical professionals at uh, the point in which they go into medical school. That would make a sea change as well. Okay. Thank, Three thank simple things. Can I just take a question from the uh, woman in front of you there and then and then I'll ask the panel to respond to whichever of those they wish. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shana Stansfield. I'm a practice manager in a GP practice in Gateshead. Um, I'd worked in the NHS for 40 years um, and it wasn't until I became a GP, uh, working in a GP practice that we started to start thinking about health inequalities and my GPs basically said, do what you need to do for the patients. And we developed all sorts of amazing stuff. And, and I was involved in developing the social prescribing network and we're doing lots and lots of work around different aspects of health creation. The biggest challenge for me is, is that the system drivers for the organizations I work with are very different. So the system drivers for the local authority are very different for secondary care, which are very different from primary care. And our contracts actually hold us apart. As a practice manager who actually really, really values connections, I can make those connections for me and my community. But what I need is actually for those above me to make those connections for me so that we can start to actually share the resources, the risks um, and the responsibilities. How do we influence that through this movement? Because I think this is a huge opportunity. A very good point. I'm going to go to the panel to respond to those um, points that have been made in those comments. And after that, I think we have to close. So. Last words. I'll just go down the line. Let's start with James. No, I think I think um, as we've highlighted, there are lots of challenges here. But um, you know, on the positive front, we have got a lot of people united now behind this uh, really great movement. And this report, I think, gives us a real uh, step change in the um, evidence, in the push, in the case um, for creative health being a fundamental part of the system. Um, where the NHS is concerned, you know, in the long term plan um, published in uh, 2019, the NHS put social activity through social prescribing at the heart of the NHS as part of um, what for 70 years at that point had been a biomedical um, system. Um, so some of the building blocks are now fundamentally in place. And I think, you know, whilst we've got a lot more to do, we can work together to um, create the vision that's in this report. Great, thank you. Martin? So I couldn't agree more that health professionals need to be educated, trained in, in this area. I think it's so fundamentally um, important. But I think, I think there is a lot that we could learn probably from the very rapid rollout of social prescribing in the NHS. Of course, there's more to creative health than the NHS or health professionals, much more, um, but actually both are quite important. Um, and it seems to me that if, if we could link the creative health ventures to the infrastructure that's developed in social prescribing, particularly link workers, um, then that could be uh, very productive. What we need as GPs more than anything is an infrastructure that we can refer into that we know is going to be stable and it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. The worst thing we see at the moment is um, opportunities for creative health, which are there for three months or six months, and so they disappear because funding went down. That doesn't help us, and it certainly doesn't help the people who might benefit. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to pick up the point about education. We, we tend to focus a bit on, on adults who either need help or, or recovering from any kind of illness. I think to cut the funding for uh, cultural activities for children from a very early age at school is a disaster, absolute disaster. And if you can get young people from the very early stage to absorb cultural activities as part of the weft and warp of their lives, undoubtedly that's going to impact upon uh, their physical, their mental, and also their social health. Thank you. Thank you. Rob. Um, yeah, so I, th I think the, the infrastructure point is really important. It might sound a bit dry and boring, but if you don't have a way of connecting and communicating between the people who pay for services and then design services and the people who can provide support, 
then it's going to be tricky. So I think through integrated care systems that do bring together councils, the NHS third sector communities, we can build the infrastructure to make this a reality. We've got enough evidence. Uh, I don't think it really costs much to, 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 to work together in a very different way and to build the connections, but we have to be courageous at a local level in saying we're going to invest in the third sector, we're going to invest in arts, we're going to promote that as something which is a reasonable, rational, impactful alternative to a medical intervention, because that will make a huge difference. Just, if, just very briefly on children and young people. Um, the narrative about children and young people in this country is pretty shocking. During COVID, everyone complained that, you know, kids were out, teenagers were out causing mayhem and ignoring the rules. The people who are most likely to ignore the rules were 50 plus. Mm. The people who were most affected by the pandemic were children, children's education, children's ambitions, people looking for their first job. Uh, we did a, some work in Bradford uh, with a group of young children and uh, young people who created films around young in COVID to get their voice out and what their experience would be like for them. And that piece of creativity is incredibly impactful and changes people's minds. And if you want to change people's behaviour, you have to change their minds. So let's create the infrastructure. Let's keep saying this is important and let's just implement the report. Thank you. Michael. Well, practical... Uh, example with evidence it's not directly on the creative part but in Coventry which was the first Marmot city they uh, decided to intervene on young people not in employment education or training by starting in school the proportion of 18 to 24 year olds not in employment education or training went down guess what the young people involved in crime went down. Now, that's not directly on creative health, but it's actually showing you really can make a difference, you know, work on it. I was in Glasgow last week. It seems to be my fate to follow creative young people um, with my sober statistics. Um, <laughs> there was a group of youngsters playing music and they talked a little bit, and everybody in the room was just uplifted. And they, I told them they were in for bad news once I started talking. <laughs> um, cling on to this feeling of hopefulness. I said. And, and these young people talked about um, what it meant to them. They come from a very <coughs> deprived part of Glasgow. And as you know, Glasgow, I've been to about 20 places that say they have the lowest life expectancy in the UK. One of them is um, part of Glasgow. And playing music for these young people, they said this, not quite the words they use, but this is our antidote to grinding poverty. This is what gives our lives meaning. We ask for Saturday school. We want to go to school on Saturday so we can come and play music. What a dampener for me to have to go and say, oh, by the way, health's getting worse. <laughs> but so it really works and you can do it. Thank you. Alice. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to start with the frustration, first of all, that I find it really frustrating that we have to demonstrate a much stronger evidence base for non-clinical interventions. If we get a shiny new drug, I'm thinking about semaglutide at the minute, you know, we get millions of pounds invested nationally, and that will remain for the foreseeable future. And what I find is that we have so it kind of feels like the scraps off the side of the plate at times, and projects come and go because there isn't sustainable funding in the way that there is for clinical interventions. So that's my frustration. But on the positive side of things, the evidence base is strong, it is clear, and this report really helps to set that out in a way that is accessible for all. So my challenge would be that this has to be our social movement. You know, we've got people in the room today, we've got people online, we've obviously got lots of people who are supportive of this. So I think that what we need to be doing is to continue to be saying the same things and challenging people like myself and the others on this panel, around actually how are we making this a reality in, 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 re in practice. Um, you know, I think medicine has moved. So if you think about a couple of decades ago, you know, sort of I'm looking at Shanaz now because I know that she set up social prescribing in Gateshead and I forget how many years ago it was now. 
but you know it was quite it was really innovative at the time what you're actually going to give people non-clinical interventions for health whereas now that's something that is more normalized so i think what we have to remember is that hope that things do change they probably don't change as fast as we would all like them to but they do change and they only change if we continue to advocate for that in the right places and with a loud voice somebody said earlier on about um, being your it was Lord Howard spoke about your anger but in a really generous way and I think that that's probably what we all need to do now is to continue saying it and saying it to the right people in the right places as much as we possibly can. Great and I think that's a really good note um, on, on which to finish I would just add if I may that um, you know a number of words to me have come out particularly of course creativity not just in terms of culture arts um, placemaking or whatever but also in terms of the way in which we campaign and create a movement. There are creative ways of doing that, and I think we can exploit that. Um, courage was another thing that was mentioned, and sometimes that does mean you're going to, we know we're going to be rebuffed. I just think of the great social me movements that we've seen in the past two or three centuries around the world, and they all take time. I'm not saying we should be patient, we should actually be impatient, but they all involve working collaboratively and forming coalitions and have a clear sense of a, a, gen, a clear sense of a general purpose, sense of purpose, if that makes sense. Not at all, Lola, stop it. Um, <laughs> it. It's this idea that you can have a general set of values and a mission and a purpose, and each sort of component can retain its own individuality. And I think that's important too. But certainly uh, interprofessional, intraprofessional, all kinds of coalitions, I think will be needed in order to make this a real movement that, that does achieve change. So I want to thank everybody on the panel. Thank you very much indeed for contributing this afternoon and sort of courage, mes amis, and forward we go. And thank you all too for uh, listening, participating. And I hope you feel sort of, um, what's the word, you know, stimulated and inspired to go out there and change everything. Thank you very much. Sorry, overran a bit, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. Woo, don't go yet. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And that was that was really inspiring, a real call to action. And um, I think I, I speak for the field, the people out there in, on the on the ground who are doing this work. And I know that that sort of energy at grassroots level is really powerful. And there are a lot of people probably in the room and on Zoom who will respond very positively to that call. Um, so we're now coming to our final speaker, Professor Richard Tremba, Senior Vice President, Health and Life Sciences, King's College London and Executive Director, King's Health Partners. The King's Health Partners or well, the King's um, College Shaper Program is cited a number of times in the report we're launching today and indeed was created in response to the original Creative Health Inquiry findings. Richard will tell us about the emerging findings from Shaper, but just before um, I, I hand over, we're going to take a breath and hear from RG Manuel Pillai, brought to us by Breathe Arts Health Research. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. How are you doing? Yeah. Nice to see you. I'm happy to be here amongst uh, people with similar vision. Uh, I am a poet. I've heard a lot of people quoting poems today. <laughs> to which I say, yeah, exactly. I, I tell them all, stay in your lane, guys. <laughs> because, uh, I'm going to read um, a poem uh, today called uh, Breathe. And I actually... I've had the privilege of working with Breathe Arts Health Research for a long time, yeah. They're worth a round of applause, actually. Give them a round of applause. Um, I'm freelance, so I, I work with a lot of companies, so I'm not, like, sponsored by them or whatever uh, to say <laughs> nice things. But uh, we have been working in hospitals, and I've seen the effect of the arts with people keeping healthy people healthy 
and helping people who are going through difficult moments in their life. And I really see their work as being at the forefront of all of this. Um, for their 10 year anniversary, they commissioned me to write this poem, which is really great for me because I had the privilege of sitting in uh, in the office, looking at the back end of it, and then going out and seeing the different groups and trying to string that together to write this poem. Um, it's called Breathe. So perhaps everyone can take a deep breath for me now. And now. Breathe. Some philosophers believe life is written in a specific number of breaths. Most go unnoticed within the day to day, but others come slow, thoughtful. When a woman has a miscarriage, a harpist plays Bach by her bedside, the woman's breath, a kind of full stop. The doctor and musician nod. They both know that music touches parts of the brain that medicine can't. In the same hospital, a porter carries mourning in the bags below her eyes, sighs a stomach full of tiredness, and a stranger offers a poem as if to say, here, have a moment to breathe. A researcher observes the shoulders shift, measures the beat of her heart, the cortisol in a test tube of her saliva, reminding us all that science and art have always been great friends. When a child sees a room of children with the same disability as him, he breathes like he is remembering how to live, like the air is golden. A man finds community in an online choir. A woman dances to arthritis. A group of mothers sing till the world sings back. All of these moments marked with a breath, deep as canyon, marked with a nurse's tick, the clinical research, Weaving change into a body, like oxygen into a breath. I guess that's what we do. Pioneering pathways through song, brushstroke, sleight of hand. We are magicians, carving moments of reflection to grasp, to gasp, to reflect, to say, we hear you, we see you, and together, we can find the strength to breathe. Well, look, um, I, I'm going to immediately thank Nikki for putting me on uh, to hold you back from the creativity that will inevitably follow. Uh, by having some refreshment uh, after this. So, so look, I'll, I'm going to be very brief and thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak with you. And, and it, can I take this opportunity on behalf of Kings to, uh, as it were, rather late in the day, welcome you here. And, and I might say we're really, really delighted that you chose to uh, launch uh, this review uh, here at Kings. Um, I'm going to make a couple of very quick comments uh, and then tell you, as was uh, anticipated, about the uh, Shaper program. Um, I, I, I was a medical student here. Uh, now that was in the last century. Um, and this room, uh, these rooms um, were obviously in the science gallery, which we at King's see as one of the great portals through which we can use uh, and, and create the opportunity to, to think about these very different ways of intersecting science, creativity, uh, uh, with a purpose behind health and health improvement. This room was uh, where the medical students could come and relax. Uh, it had a beautiful parquet floor. Uh, it looked rather more reminiscent of a, a gentleman's club in St. James's than the room it is now, uh, uh, even with leather chairs, uh, uh, a little side table with, of course, an ashtray uh, on, on the side table. So we've come a long way, I think, is the principle I'm trying to tell you here. And I am delighted to tell you that we, as a medical school here at King's, do have the humanities and indeed creative arts very richly embedded, not only in our medical programme, but across all of the health professional programmes that we offer and have done for at least the last 10 years. Uh, and, and we see that, and I have to say, um, see that as a, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, and not only rich the education of our students, but ensure that that is portrayed in the ways in which they then practice 
uh, their, their uh, health care. So um, just a couple of uh, you know, re relevant, but I think important ways in which King's holds not only culture, but the whole concept of creativity as lying at the heart of the ways in which we see health and health needs uh, being developed over the next, uh, next period of time. Um, and we're fortunate because, of course, we are a multi-faculty university and we have outstanding arts and humanities who can lie alongside uh, our health sciences. So in that regard, and I thought I'd move straight to talk a little bit about the uh, shape of programme, for which, of course, I have made no contribution directly, so I have the honour of being able to uh, talk about it, but uh, um, haven't directly uh, contributed to it. So the shape of programme stands for Scaling Health Arts Programmes Effectiveness Research. And it's a programme that was, in fact, funded um, through a, a grant from the Wellcome Trust. And it's been running for over a four and a half year uh, period, um, supported through two and a half million pounds of funding from the Wellcome. Um, the programme has been led by Professor Carmine uh, Parienti from our Institute of uh, Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, and Carmine is here and I'm sure will be delighted to talk more uh, about the programme uh, over refreshment. Others involved, uh, and we heard mention earlier of uh, Daisy Fancourt, who's UCL, uh, uh, a co-investigator, uh, Professor Paola Dezan uh, and Professor Ray Chowdhury, both again of the R Institute of uh, Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. Um, uh, the programme itself was de devised and de uh, managed um, by Tony, Tony Woods of IOPPN and uh, supported greatly, I have absolutely no doubt, by Nikki, Nikki Crane uh, from our culture team. So, um, it, it, Shaper really was part of the opportunity to ask the question of how do we respond, how do we further build that evidence base. Of course, we've heard, is there a need for further evidence, but a further build an evidence base uh, for creative health, especially in, in longitudinal programs as opposed to uh, just sectional. Uh, and then to investigate the mechanisms by which you could scale up effectiveness and then explore how you embed arts programs in not only the educational programs, but in actual clinical pathways of care, uh, including uh, becoming a part of social prescribing. Now, the areas that we have focused on uh, are three. Um, they are stroke, Parkinson's, and postnatal depression. So whilst the work is ongoing, indeed, uh, more detailed analysis, uh, we hope will be completed um, and indeed even published during 2024, I can give you some indicators as to uh, what really has uh, been emerging. So in Shaper, two clinical trials have been undertaken. The first to look at the effects of melodies for mums, a singing program for mothers uh, and their babies uh, with a particular focus on postnatal depression. And that was led by the Breathe Arts Health Research that we were just hearing about. Dance for People with Parkinson's, PD Ballet, which was led by the English National Ballet. And then a programme has been undertaken to perform a qualitative study termed Stroke Odysseys. And that's been de devised by, the, uh, by Rosetta Life and works with people who are recovering from stroke. Now, in the Melodies uh, for Mums program, uh, it is clear that there is evidence emerging that uh, the program is uh, correlated with decrease in depression scores for women uh, with postnatal depression and a more general improvement in their well being. In the Dance for Parkinson's program, there's clear evidence of improvement in motor function, a decrease in pain and an improvement in the non-motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's. And through the Stroke, uh, Stroke Odyssey uh, Arts Programme, uh, again, emerging clear and significant evidence of an increase in the quality of life of people post-stroke. 
And this has also uh, been taken forward because it has been won a health systems commission um, commissioning uh, in, in Berkshire. And indeed, I have no doubt other uh, health systems uh, around the country will look to do so. Actually, uh, as evidence of further impact, the English National Ballet Programme uh, has been commissioned in both Northwest and Northeast uh, by both the Northwest and the Northeast Integrated Care Systems. And then the breathe, uh, in the uh, 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 Melody for Mums program, this has also already been commissioned at the mother and baby unit at the Bethlehem Hospital. So uh, I, although a very brief uh, overview of these programs uh, and indeed much more that will emerge from them, I, I hope you would agree that these are really strong indicators and impactful uh, uh, outcomes uh, from these um, evidence-based uh, uh, studies. And I'm hugely grateful to all of the investigators and all the individuals who have taken part. So with that, um, may I once again thank you for being here at King's, at Guy's, uh, to really ensure that we um, are very conscious and very cognizant of the opportunities that lie ahead uh, and the ways in which those of us heavily involved in educating the next generation uh, will ensure that uh, we hold hold these ambitions very very dear so i'm um, now i'm not sure i think i'm probably heading, handing back to you to just close uh, and get us to some refreshment thank you very much Thank you very much, Professor Trembuff, and thank you again to King's and uh, the Science Gallery for hosting us this evening. Thank you to all the staff here, King's staff and the National Centre staff, and thank you to our audience. We're about to say goodbye to our online audience, so thank you for joining us and thank you to our in-person audience. Um, we're now um, going to go through, if you can stay, for some refreshments, as Richard said, and also we have music by Sharika Sherard. Um, so we're going to go over to the workshop across the corridor and just to say that Sharika, as well as performing live in venues in England and around the world and recording al albums, she also regularly brings her heartwarming singing to patients and staff at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital as part of Breathe Arts Health Research's extensive arts programme for the Hospital Trust. So thank you everyone and hope to see you over the corridor. <laughs>